So, so everyone knows we were, we were talking, of course, our conversation continues and, and Jim and, uh, Jeff here, we were talking about interview styles and I have this thing where I always tell them, I'm like, Hey, you know, I don't want to talk too much. So I'm going to step back. Like, I don't know if anyone ever does like those DEI courses or you go to like these soft skill courses at work. And they're like, if you're, you know, a person who's really talkative and then you want to be a step back. And if you're the kind of person who's not assertive, you know, you want to step forward. So I'm usually the one I basically mentally tie myself in the corner of the room to shut up because it, people say something and it just sparks ideas. That's why I'm in communications, I guess. And that's why I write just to get all my ideas out. So, 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 uh, I don't know, Jim, I don't know what kind of person you are at soft skill classes or Jeff, you know, if you're a step forward or step back kind of person, uh, I end up being very assertive. My job kind of requires it. So I, uh, when we, especially when we do these shows, I kind of have to step back and <laughs> keep myself under control. I'm uh, I'm very much an introvert, but uh, um, I find that like when something has to get done and no one's being assertive, I will step up and just get get on with it because uh, too many people are so easygoing and laid back and won't take the step and like we got to get on with it. We got stuff to do. Let's do it. Go move. So that that leadership kind of like forward momentum kind of thing comes up, and uh, I, I've learned to flex out of my introversion and uh, just to get stuff done because so, sometimes stuff just has to get done. And if no one's stepping up to do it, then then I'm the one to like, OK, let's go move. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> well, I laugh because I think it was probably about a month ago. I had a sore throat. I had a horrible sore throat. And before the show, I I texted Jim and I was like, well, you know, Jim, I'm not feeling too well. I have a sore throat. So if you could kindly take the lead. And then I went back and I listened to the show and I was like, I'm talking so much for somebody with sore throat. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I'd be curious, Michael, do you, do you consider yourself an introvert or an extrovert? Which what's funny. And I, in my heart, I am actually an introvert. I test out as an introvert. I actually, what I'm doing right now, zoom has been a lifesaver for me. Like I don't get any back pain or neck pain when I do zoom. And I think cause it's more intimate feeling to me, but, um, for people who don't know me, I, I sometimes have to get up in very large crowds, like 1500 people and teach classes. And that has a taxing effect on me. And I come home and I just turn on star Trek pour a glass of wine. And I don't want to talk to anyone. So I do it because I go into performance mode, but my preference, if you, if you gave me a button and a preference of stay home, right in the confines of my own office or to go in front of a crowd of people, I'll always pick being alone. I just, I'm very okay being alone. How about you? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm off the scale introvert. I mean, I, I've, ch- I've taken all the tests, whatever. And uh, I'm consistently on the far the far side of introversion versus extroversion. I, mean, I, I like I said, I, I'm able to flex when, when needed, especially at work. Uh, mm-hmm. when, when I need to, when I need to, but, uh, in general, I prefer the, uh, the quiet room, small, intimate conversations, like big groups, hate them. Like I, I hate small talk. Oh my God. Small talk drives <laughs> me absolutely insane. Like I, I just want to get, in, I want to find out if you're a Star Trek fan <laughs> and then just like intimately talk with you all night long on the couch. Like who cares what everybody else is doing at the party. We're talking Star Trek and, and like, we got that connection and we're going, um, like, like I'm not the life of the party. I just, I don't care about big parties. It just drives me crazy. <laughs> I, I hate big parties. If I, I sneak out, I never say goodbye at big parties. Cause I don't want to have to talk to everyone. So I like everyone laughs and I'm like, sneak out the left. <laughs> yeah. Jeff, what about you? Introvert, extrovert? I tend to be more introverted. Although, uh, I've done a lot of LARPing, which has gotten me much more open and mm. uh, exposed. And one of the things I like about podcasting, the reason I got into podcasting actually is because I like doing interviews one-on-one and there's a very intimate nature to these things. Like you guys are in my headphones. You're right here. You can't get closer to me than that. So it's, it's just us. And then of course the thousands of people who are hopefully listening to the show, right. but they don't, you know, it's, it's, um, I'm definitely introverted. I would prefer to stay home whenever possible, but I have, this performer uh, aspect to my life. Uh, so I did a lot of performance. Um, yeah, it's someone, not necessarily me, but I'm out there performing. So. No, so, what, one of the things that actually cured me and and helped me get over myself was the karaoke. A friend suggested I do karaoke because they said you don't have to sound good. Get up there, act a fool. No one's judging you because for when you do it for work or stuff, you know, there's a lot of judgment going on. And karaoke became a like a really good therapy 
for me. Um, where uh, more thing than role playing were for me. Same thing, yeah. Which is really good. Interesting. I, I found that uh, not not to belabor the episode. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, I found I find that uh, one of the things that I encourage other introverts to do, is, if they want to, not so much break out of their shell, but if they want to try to be a little bit more um, outgoing, uh, go audition for a play. Go find your local community theater and go audition for a play. Even if you don't get cast, at least go audition because you're you're getting up in front of people. You got the script in front of you, so it's a little bit of a crutch. It's okay, and then just just see what happens and just. Uh, especially for writers, like I love giving this advice to writers: go, go watch stage plays, but also go audition for one and get into one and feel how the words and the dialogue feel in your mouth because that'll make you a better writer because you'll be thinking about it differently. You'll be approaching I, it from a different angle. Um, I but anyway, got cast a student film. I, I went and cast a student film because of that. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're doing one now, right, Jeff? You're doing a student film. Yeah, I'll be in a student film. Uh, I'm starring in a student film for Washington Community College, a, a guy I've known for a long time. So Super see, cool. I. I think this does fall into what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to about to get into it, but I want to say that I actually found that both karaoke and performing arts, like on a stage play, I actually find it, even though you're in front of a crowd of people, I find it an extremely intimate art form. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, we could, and we're going to talk about actually how game mastering is kind of the same today. We're going to be talking about having what a, what a game master's Bible is and a glossary and all that, and how you're building a story, just like singing a song or building a play. But I, I what do you think? I actually think it's very intimate performing arts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Especially. So I've done stage, um, I've done maybe a half dozen plays on stage over the course of my life. Um, I've started a couple and I've done, uh, I've been lead in a couple and I've done a couple that were just like background characters. Um, and I think that as a lead actor in a stage play or now some film that I've done, um, it's, it is extremely intimate because it's you, the character that you are and the story you're telling. And yeah, the audience is there, but I mean, I don't remember ever seeing the audience anytime I've ever done stage. Like you, they're there. I know they're there and I get their reactions, but their reactions are the, are, because I can't see the people their the reactions just encourage. Um, and it's not like it's, it's a faceless entity to me. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think there is an intimacy to that. It's the same thing with the podcasting. Um, mm -hmm. I get the feedback, but it's, it's blind, you know, so it's just very encouraging. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I've been very similarly. Uh, so I, I've done my share of, you know, community theater and been on stage for 15 years or whatever. And um, most of the time, when I was doing, I mean, I was never the lead because that's just not my, I'm, I'm, I'm a character actor. I'm never, never going to be a lead. <laughs> I don't want to be, I don't want that much work. It's way more fun being the character actor because you get, you have fewer lines, you have more fun stuff. And people often remember the character, character roles more than they remember the leads. Like they don't want to watch Hamlet. They, they know Hamlet back and forth. They want to see Ros Rosencrantz and Guildenstern and uh, everybody else. But anyway, um, yes, absolutely. Most of the time when I'm on stage, I don't wear my glasses. And if I don't have contacts, the 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 audience is a blur anyway they're usually mm -hmm. in the dark and then they're a blur anyway so i can't see them but i can feel them right you can feel the energy and you can feel it when they're with you or, or when they're in the moment and they're they're vibing off what the actors are doing which is really cool um but the i think the neatest experience i had was we, we did a, a shakespeare show and um the director wanted us to be intentional about finding the beats and and picking out people in the audience to direct lines to and to get them to pull them in. And uh, I mean, we were amateurs, so I think, you know, we did okay, but, but I went to, uh, I went to Stanton, Stanton, Virginia, the, uh, the American Shakespeare theater is in Stanton and they have a recreation of the Blackfriars theater, which is just an amazing, it's an amazing theater and they do all their performances with the lights up. Right. So the actors can see all the audience, the audience can see every, everything is very obvious. It's just like how Shakespeare would have, uh, Run it back in the day when you're in the globe, you know, it's sunny weather or it's raining or whatever. The audience is right there in the in the cheap seat or you know, standing at the stage. Mm -hmm. And it is such it's such a powerful experience to have an actor on stage doing their stuff, but they're looking right at you. Like they're directing that line right at you, or they're throwing the joke at you and they're, they're trying to pull you into the show. And it, it makes me really think that that's a lot like what we do as gamers right as, as game masters and players we're trying to draw each other in into the story and into the narrative and uh well it's yeah i mean it's funny because 
Yeah. You want to feel it. Even with workshops that I run, I never run them from a stage. The worst thing you could do with me is put me on a stage with a mic behind a podium. I hate that. In fact, when I set up my rooms, I always set the chairs facing in a, a certain direction. So people assume they're at the back of the room and I start at the back of the room and they have to turn their chairs. So everyone who came in, the natural introverts or the people who want to be at the back of the room, they uh, end up at the front of my room. So I set them off right at the beginning and I start talking from the back and then I weave by every table and uh, I touch people, you know, appropriately, like on the shoulder or okay. near them, you know, in order to really get that one-on-one -on -one contact because behind a podium, uh, that's the worst. Cause you, you just don't know, like you're looking far back. It's like, who's ignoring me and who's on their phones. That's like the worst. So interesting. And that goes into game mastering. So hi everyone. This is continuing conversations. My name is Michael. This Mika. <laughs> I'm a freelance writer for Star Trek adventures, RPG, and um, also a blogger on continuing missions, which is the number one uh, blog for Star Trek adventures, RPG. Uh, we're going to give it to Jim. And the reason we were talking about this, and then we're going to give it over to Jeff because Jeff actually brought up the subject. So we're going to let, him lead the interview and michael's going to step back I'm but go try. ahead jim <laughs> i'm gonna try i will try i need i need like a bell to ding every time you <laughs> take over <laughs> please anyway, hi everybody i'm uh, jim johnson i'm the project manager and line editor for the star trek adventures rpg published by modifius entertainment low these many years and co-host on this here show with michael low these many episodes going 60 something almost pushing 70 now i think been a while and uh, super excited to be here. And I think, Michael, uh, I know we, we do not track this statistic, but that might have been the longest, like, <laughs> riff digression free introduction that we've done so far in the show after. Yeah, we've I hope it. you people yeah. tell us if you like that or not, or if you want yeah. us to jump into it. Tell us in social media. We're curious. I'm, I'm curious because, like, I, I have my own opinions, but that's probably a different show. Uh, anyway, so let's uh, let's uh, introduce our our, our guest tonight also our guest host as it were assuming we can get michael to uh to hold back a little bit we'll see how it goes uh jeff please introduce yourself my name is jeff harvey i am a writer performer uh podcast editor and all those other things that i do it's lots of stuff uh, you can find me at studio tembo if you're watching the show on youtube you've probably already found my stuff um and there is more stuff coming on this channel uh as well as uh if you want to find this if you like watching the show and you want to listen to it, also you can find it on all of the, the places that you would find free podcasts, including your smart devices. Just tell your smart devices that you want to listen to the show and continue conversations, and it will come up uh, the other day. Worked on Google, so um, yeah, that's me. Uh, awesome. As for this episode, we're going to talk about how to be uh, how to create things like show bibles and how to be uh, do some game mastering and writing some of your stories like that. And before we get too far into it, I want to say that. Um, I got the idea of show Bibles from doing a lot of, I do a lot of script writing, a lot of uh, ongoing shows. And one year day I was looking for some information on Michael Okuda and Michelle Okuda about one of the shows. I don't know. I think it was Star Trek. It was obviously next gen. Um, and I came across the 1987, March 23rd, 1987 Star Trek, the next generation writers and directors Bible. that talks about how the show was written, what is done in the show and what stories work for it and what don't. Um, and then all the technical stuff, like how transporters work, what they do, things like that. And that, to me, got me in the idea of when I'm running games, because I run games like TV shows uh, a lot of times, um, to having those story Bibles. And I think um, it helps me anyways. I don't know. I'll ask you guys for sure. But uh, it helps me to come up with not only the, the backstory of the setting that I want to do, but also come up with how I'm going to integrate characters and how I'm going to integrate the ship and all these things we've talked about in previous episodes, playing the captain, playing all sorts of things. And one of the episodes that is coming out or has come out already is the ship as a character. And this is one of the things that you can really get into in the Star Trek, the the, the, the writer's Bible. Um, I don't know. Do you guys use any of these things for any of the games you've run? Uh, or I know, Michael, you've done uh, comic books and things like that. Do you use anything for that kind of stuff or no? Um, yeah, for comic books, you know, I have my manga game masters that I write. I definitely have a a page for every single character and a general plot script and also kind of a how things work in that particular universe of, of uh, Rochambeau. Uh, um, and, and definitely for Star Trek, we're going to get into it tonight. I, I can talk about a lot of the tools that I use. Yeah, I am. I am super, super excited for this episode. Like I, I, I knew it was coming and I'm so excited because um, like, it, like this is the props episode. We I, I got a couple books here that I can show off. But uh, Jeff, nice. what you're saying is exactly exactly where I where I was. Uh, it would, must have been the early '90s. I went to a Star Trek convention, and uh, this was back when 
next gen was in its absolute heyday, fourth season, fifth season, just firing on all thrusters. DS9 had just come out and was was really, really dynamic and different. And I went to a, a Star Trek convention and one of my one of my first, and I went into the dealer's room and I had no idea what I was walking into, but there was a there was a there was a guy at a table, and he was selling uh, illegally, of course, admittedly, you know, because I, I didn't know any better back in the day. But he was <laughs> selling he was selling uh, uh, photocopied scripts, and he had he had he had photocopied the uh, the writer's guide, the next gen writer's guide. This was even before the uh, the tech manual came out. He had he had the the next generation like season four uh, writer's guide or whatever. And in this writer's guide was, uh, you know, character synopses, you know, character, you know, briefs, bios, a couple of pages, you know, a couple of paragraphs on where they were going with the story, the technology, the, the all this really amazing stuff. And they called it a, a series Bible or show Bible or whatever. And like my young mind had never even imagined that such a thing was was a thing. Right. Like, I mean, I certainly played plenty of role playing games, but uh, not as a game master to the level where I was like, you know, building a Bible of the show or whatever. And so buying that that next gen writer's Bible was really a revelation for me. Um, and then a couple of years later, uh, uh, you know, Judith and Garfield Reeves, Reeves Stevens came out with this most amazing book called The Making of Deep Space Nine. And this this is like this is like show Bible 101. This is like everything you need to know about building a series, building characters, building plot, world building all this stuff that you need, you don't need, but like as a game master, you're probably thinking about it. What's my campaign going to be? What's my story going to be? How do the player characters get involved? All this stuff. And so like between the next gen writer's Bible and the DS nine making of book, those were like some of the foundations of my writing career, because like everything I do for writing now, I have to have a show Bible. I have to have a series Bible. I have to have something that I can start filling with content to get my brain percolating and for the longest time, I did it all on paper, of course, or you know, post-it notes or three by five cards or whatever. And I've since transitioned over to digital, where I've got everything on Scrivener now. I created a Scrivener project file for everything, and I just fill I fill that thing all day long with uh, content. And uh, <laughs> it's just amazing. But everything everything is based on Star Trek. The, those two books, the 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 next gen uh, writer's Bible, the the old crappy flimsy uh, facsimile copies that, that are that were bratted together. Um, and then the uh, the DS9 books. So, uh, yeah, big, big pieces of my of my history. Yeah. And this is advanced game mastering stuff. It's not something you have to do by any no. means, but it really does for for those of you who want to write. Uh, a longer series of things like that, it can really help keep what I the thing that matters most to me when telling a story is internal consistency. Right. Um, Star Trek has a tendency to and we all know this has a tendency to be very um, contrary to itself during different seasons or different episodes, different series. Um, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I like the internal consistency and that's what these Bibles are really good for is, mm-hmm. you know, what deck is, uh, 10 forward on, we know it's on 10, not deck 10, but what else is on deck 10? Where, where is Citation ops? Once you mention it on a show, you write it down in your Bible, and you know where it's at from then forward. Yeah. You can keep consistency. Yeah. Um, I want to, pl- yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and I want to plug too. If anyone needs an example of if they're playing Star Trek Adventures and want an example of a show Bible, I'm going to plug the Shackleton Expanse Guide. That is actually a show Bible in a sense because it doesn't get into exactly what the story is, but it does talk about all the characters, their background. It provides some sample episodes, sample character stats. So if you're wondering like what this looks like, we're going to talk about our own. But I feel that something like a Shackleton Expanse Compendium is a really good show Bible or the Discovery one too. Yeah, you yeah. can also just Google the show Bible for TNG. It's out there. Um, it's not <laughs> really great for next gen, but I'm actually I have it pulled up right here. Um, it's not necessarily great for role playing, but it does give you an idea of what goes into a Bible and and the things you can do with it. I mean, one thing I think that you can do with a show Bible, and one thing I think I don't do enough with, is so in the TNG Bible guide in Bible there is a section that talks about stories that do and don't work. Like, these are the stories that we know will work. These are the stories we know won't work for Star Trek. Um, and I think that when you're doing your session zero, these are really good things to start getting into too. like talk about the kind of stories that your players are going to want and the kind of stories that you want to get and make sure you write that down. Make sure you write out like not just plot points they want to hit, but um, the kind of stories that you guys as a group are going to want to tell any of the kind of stories that you as a group would want to stay away from. Um, I think that's a very important aspect and it's a key part of a lot of Bibles. Like when you're writing the, the, uh, 
the layout of what the show is going to be. What do you guys, what's the first thing that you guys tend to put in your Bible? Like, I don't know if we said you do two of them. So let's, let's start getting into like the breakdown of what goes into them. Uh, Michael, what, what's the first things you tend to put in yours? Um, when I'm playing Star Trek Adventures, the very first most important thing are the characters. So I want the character sheets. I want their backstories. I want a little bit about what ships they served on. I want the history of the ship because the ship is a character. So really starting with that and to your point that you just mentioned, Jeff, is I want to know what do they want their characters? I want, what, what do they want their arc to be? Where are their characters going? So I, as a game master can help get them there because without knowing that there's no use me building story and plot points and encounters if it's going to be in conflict where all the characters want to go in the first place if they don't want to be in the Shackleton Expanse why would I write stories to go to the Shackleton Expanse what if they want to be just between Andoria and Vulcan the whole time then I need to know what their characters want to get out of the game to make it fun for them so really I start with the characters mm -hmm. Jim do you, use a, do you use them for the names you're running that kind of stuff what's the first things you tend to put in them yeah I think I think I mean, nowadays, because it's such a collaborative experience, I, I really wait until session zero to start building the the binder. Like, I mean, I have a I have a separate binder of like Star Trek ideas and notes and stuff where I, I've compiled all kinds of stuff and like things I'd like to do or things I'd like to explore. But when I'm intentional about creating a new game, um, I'm really relying on the players to work with me to figure out, OK, what do we want? You know, I, I have certainly gone to the to the extreme i don't know if you call it, call it an extreme or not where i've actually sat down my group in in a living room or at a like one of the buffet restaurants or something and i've pulled out the whiteboard and i said you know boom boom t t bar what do you want what don't you want you guys know star trek you know you back backwards and forwards just as well as i do what era do you want to play in what kind of ship do you want to be in who wants to play what role what what characters you want to be senior officers you want to be junior officers who's the captain who's the xo you know just down the list we've got it you know down to a routine um and uh once we get those initial concepts figured out that paperwork all goes into the binder um in one form or another whether it's actual paper or or it's all on my scrivener uh you know project file uh to where i can start actually seeing okay here's the players here's the characters here's what they want to play Here's the here's generally what era we're going to play in, what kind of ship they want to be in, because that's all going to inform what kind of stories we tell to some extent. Right. If you're on an Oberth class ship versus a sovereign, you're going to tell very different stories. I mean, you could tell the same stories, but it's just going to have a very different feel. Uh, yeah. Right. Um, so that goes in. And then as soon as they start creating their character sheets and their backstories and their bios and all that great stuff, that all goes into the Bible. Um, and then NPCs will start creating NPCs together, like ideally. The players, especially the department heads, the ones who are playing like the chiefs of security and engineering and medical, like, like the, the, they often take it upon themselves to start creating NPCs, even if it's just a name and a specialty. That's enough, especially for Star Trek Adventures. That's, that's almost your uh, supporting character right there is uh, you got a name, a specialty and maybe a focus and, and you can you can riff off that easily. Um, so that's that's usually the, the foundational stuff is like what what's the game that the players want to play with me? What's the ship? What's the era? And then I'll start, you know, because it's digital, I can start filling it with pictures and uh, yeah. and uh, MP3s and uh, audio files and stuff. Yeah. So I tended to, when I started running the Europa game, I actually started with the history and all the things that I wanted to do first. And then I recruited players that wanted to play in it. So I, think I published, this is what we're going to be doing. And I want to get players involved. So mm -hmm. one of the first things I did is I actually play that on a timeline of the last three years because it's post-Dominion War. And we don't have a lot of Star Trek TV show for that. So I came up with the... Like I went to beta canon and all that kind of stuff. And I went through, these are the things that I've got. This is the history. This is what you know. You can build your characters based on this. Um, I also put in some house rules, things like that. Um, and the ship. The ship is a very important aspect of my the story that I wanted to do. We talked about the ship being a character. In my game, it literally is a character. It's an AI. Um, so I, I, and I put in the background for all of that, how it came about, uh, how it tied into Bruce Maddox and the, the stuff with Data and all that. Um, so I think that's an important thing too. And I, I think then we added the characters in on top of that. Um, one thing that I like, and I, I tend to get technical with a lot of my Star Trek stuff. Um, I know, Jim, I know you're a big fan of the Star Trek technical manual. Um, I take a lot of content right out of that and I put it right into my ship so that players can see here's how torpedoes work. Here's how transporters work. Here's uh, what fellow craft are aboard your ship. And here's what, you know, different probes do, that kind of stuff. So the players are there and have the consistency. Um, I don't know if that's something you guys go that far with. I know that that's certainly not required for anybody to go that far. Um, I get carried away. 
<laughs> well, I mean, if it's established canon, I'm going to lean back on a fantastic set of Star Trek Adventures compendiums, whether it's the operations manual, the player's guide, game master's guide. I'm going to lean back on that or send them to memory alpha in order to, during a game, quickly um, uh <laughs> define that but what i do do is i keep something called a game glossary so we play in discord so i have different channels for different types of things going on so in my case i have characters they've met who are kind of important especially if i know it's going to be a reoccurring character i need it so that when that character returns i can quickly send them a hashtag to that channel so they can read up what's in the data files of the ship so that they can remember so i do that for main characters that was really important during the shackleton experience campaign that we ran because even though the Shackleton Expanse guide um, had some details, I had to tweak them for my game. So I didn't want them getting confused. So they needed to know how we were using these characters and places in our game. And that included um, in the glossary, important locations because I knew I'd be referencing them in the future. And so I needed a definition of those locations. And finally, the technology. So we create a lot of our own technology and we push the sciences. Space folding is pretty big in our game as opposed to just warp drive. Space folding has come up quite a bit and we had to create a science and an element and a molecule to sustain it. So I put all that science into a game glossary so that I can consistently cut and paste or send them to that to reference it. They take a couple minutes to look at it and they come back sounding like experts. So anything that has rules and mechanics, I keep in the game glossary and it grows and grows and grows every season. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I am. I am much the same way. And I will, this will be a insight into my brain, but Jeff, you sound, you sound a lot like me in some respects in this, in this respect. Uh, I mean, so back in the day, right. This was the, the nineties and, uh, you know, we were doing a homebrew because uh, we didn't like we didn't like less we didn't like FASA enough to keep playing it the way it was written, and uh, we liked Last Unicorn Games, but we wanted it to be more narrative, right? We wanted to more narrative, so we created our own. But um, at the time, I was the one most knowledgeable about Star Trek, and I was the only one who happened to have a copy of the encyclopedia, right? The Star Trek encyclopedia that Michael Kuda and uh, and Sternbach and everybody and Denise Okuda worked on, uh, among other people. Um, but I took it upon myself <laughs> because at one time I was playing a Bajoran and uh, we all agreed that it was important for us to have a better understanding of Bajor um, and, and all the stuff that's related to Bajor. So I took it upon myself to take the encyclopedia over a course of a couple of weekends. And I went through that encyclopedia page by page and every single Bajoran reference I transcribed into a Word document and, and printed out that Word document so that the other players and game masters could have that on hand, that, that little glossary of Bajor stuff so that we could, you know, get that at the game table. Um, I also happened to be playing the doctor. I was playing a Bajoran doctor. And I also took it upon myself to go through that stupid encyclopedia again and pulled out every medical reference that I could find. Every drug that was referenced, every medical procedure that was referenced, the awards, the Carrington Award. So I had like two separate, like 20 page documents, just like basically glossaries, right? Just pulled right out of the encyclopedia and with uh, some embellishments. So I had I had a medical encyclopedia and I had a major encyclopedia <laughs> and, and like I, I carted those with me every time we played a different uh, campaign or whatever. I'd still have that those those two documents, right, because they were still useful resource material. And so they every time I created a new binder, like uh, and, and like and I'm talking physical, like physical, actual binder. Right. For every campaign, those those two documents would just kind of come along with me because they were already three hole punched. So and, this was before uh, Google Docs, I take it. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, this is before the Internet, really. <laughs> I mean, we're, you're talking 94, 95, right? There, there was we didn't we barely even had CompuServe or uh, AOL, right? It was it was very different world. And that, you know, I mean, showing my age, I got the gray in my beard. But uh, this is this was before, you know, Scrivener and before Google Docs and before any of that stuff. Uh, was hanging by the minute for your internet. <laughs> I mean, this is so I mean, seriously, guys, this is so far back. Like the episode synopses that my co-GM and I wrote, like this, the paper I've got is, is still the old dot matrix stuff, right? Remember that when you printed the paper and you had to, you had to tear off the, the, the perforated um, sides that fed into the, into the printer machine. And then you had to actually, the, the pages were perforated, right? Cause, cause it was like one long ribbon of paper that fed through the printer and you had to tear off each sheet. And so I've still got that stuff, but what, what's funny is that the, they're so old that the ink is fading and if I don't at some point scan these in or transcribe them, I'm going to lose the, the words because they're so old. But anyway, that's that's a digression. Um, oh, yeah. Speaking of which, here's another digression to digress further. 
I, me personally, I have never met a game master who was not a pack rat, right? Like every single game master I know has got binders and binders of stuff on their shelves from games of your that they cannot get rid of really you don't michael you don't uh you don't i am i'm a minimalist i oh wow okay well uh, first time for me then yeah i in fact when i did back in the day even play it i have one cabinet that i kept everything in and Uh then once we started going electronically i was all pdf all the way Uh I, i the only reason i have the full star trek uh, stuff now is because the books are such high quality that I said they look like art pieces, so they yeah. look really good on my wall. But oh, but um, I'm 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 not into paper. That's interesting. I have, but, I have notes yeah. going back to my very first character and my very first yeah. campaign that I've ever run. Uh, yeah, I've got lots of stuff. I scan I scanned them in the minute I could and created them into PDFs. Literally, when it came, I, I remember I had the big fat scan discs, if you remember that. And, mm-hmm. and then I had a work where we had a scanner. And so the minute I literally spent weeks getting all my paper into electronic, and to this day, I still have it on Dropbox and Google Drive. Oh, wow. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I, this could probably get into like the whole psychology of, of gamers and papers and stuff. But like, the 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 binders that I still have, especially especially the Star Trek binders, like like all my campaign stuff, like all, all my campaign stuff over the last 30s, blah, blah, blah years is all in this binder. And like there are so many memories associated with all this stuff that, that it's like is a thing I can it tangibly like it, it's hard to look at a PDF and say that's something tangible that I can remember. Right. That's just, it's just me personally. Uh, but like having this binder on the shelf that I can occasionally pull off and flip through and like see the characters and like where were we at the time thinking about these characters and the concepts and the stories it's just very different to have it in a physical format versus a Digital. If I were you, I, w- I would I would only make it electronic so you could bound it because it's so cheap to bound a book nowadays. And I would make that an art piece for yourself because that is your I, I want to honor that legacy. That's such a huge legacy. And and I actually did take mine, my RPGs, and I have them in bound book form now. Yeah. Because oh, awesome. all, all that stuff, all the stories I wrote about them. So I did, I do honor that. Um, but I, because it's art to you and I'm sure your progeny would love it and family would love it. I honestly would, yeah. would bound that if I were you. Yeah. 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 That's, that's a real challenge though, is like, especially the, the last campaign I ran uh, for Star Trek Adventures, we, we did like 35, 36 episodes. And uh, I was very studious, studious, whatever, uh, in recording all those sessions, right? So I, I've got the recordings of everything, but I have not gone back to transcribe them all because so it's such a pain in the ass to to listen to something for three hours and then listen to it again for three hours and listen to it it's just to make sure I get the transcription right. Because I would love to do a book um, like that, right? Um, One word, Fiverr. Check it up, Fiverr. Fiverr. Oh, go pay somebody to do it? Yeah, I mean, I could do that, but... Uh, uh, it's just so much work, but uh, I, I would love to do that someday. But I'd have to be really intentional about doing it from the start of the campaign, as opposed to you know a year into it, going, "Ah, oh, shit, I got I got twenty episodes I need to transcribe." I don't have that kind of time. <laughs> so I don't know about YouTube. Um, one of the cool things about having all that information, though, and, and going back to the Bible thing, is if you're going to run a campaign that has, um, I tend to run games for a lot of the same players, not necessarily the same characters, but we'll have the same players, and I like to be able to reference the stories that we've already told yeah. in previous campaigns, so that they get to enjoy that. And using these story Bibles that you, or the binders, the, the I tend to put it all in the, in the stuff, but having all that information there allows you to tell little nuanced stories that the player might remember, they might not remember, but if you can remind them, you know, what it was, then they t- you tend to get that, that deeper connection to the world that you're creating. I think that's yeah. a fun way to do it. Um, when you guys are putting stuff into your, your glossaries or whatever you want to call them, uh, Jim, you said you got a lot of information from the, uh, the, encyclopedia which is how i started as well uh before i even knew there was a fossa game or really what gaming was i was creating a star trek rpg and i was going through that book and doing all that where would you guys find a lot of your information i mean michael i know you said something about uh, memory alpha i like to use a star trek a site called star trek minutia um i also use a bunch of like the the play to play by post groups are amazing for finding stuff mm-hmm. um, so where do you guys find a lot of your information from for this kind of stuff or is it something you do off the top of your head Mm-mm. You want to go first, Michael? Sure. Um, <laughs> um, that's such a big question because everything, I mean, I, I, I rely heavily on the internet for schematics of ships, of course, and there's no reason for me to recreate technology for Star Trek, like transporters and stuff. There's, It's so well mapped on the internet. Um, we don't play canon. 
So we do deviate from Canon at some point. So I don't have to worry too much about that because we're creating our own story. Um, but really it's top of my head it, when it comes to science technologies, pictures and stuff like that, I scour the internet for things that look good. I actually keep a, a file of great art or concept art. And I just keep it because sometimes I'm like, Oh, that's going to make a good story one day. And, and I'm going to be able to use that piece of technology and stuff like that. And, you know, you don't have to worry because, since it's all internal, there's no copyright issues I have to worry about. Whatever I find on the internet, if it's there, it's mine to create into my world. I'm not publishing this stuff. Um, so really the entire internet, um, I'll say Wikipedia too. I'll, I will go there. I will find science, uh, science facts at science.com. Uh, also at, at, uh, at space.com. And I'm going to pull off of that and change the wording in order to make it suited for my game. And that's how I build my glossary to and explain the sciences. So people are like, wow, that actually sounds possible. Well, yeah, it's a little bit of techno babble thrown in on top of truth. Um, and, and so I just, I scour a lot. I read a lot. And when I do, I bookmark and cut and paste and keep it into my um, private folders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jim. Yeah. Uh, you know, very, very similar. I think I, you know, I have just because I'm old, <laughs> I've had, you know, 40 odd years worth of uh, Star Trek, uh, you know, books and uh, technical manuals and uh, stuff that's just been published over the decades. And uh, I always lean on those kind of as my primary uh, resources. Yeah. You know, of course the episodes are the primary, but uh, the, I always, I always, for some reason, tend to gravitate toward flipping through books and looking at stuff on the page. Um, of course, you know, Wikipedia space.com. Uh, astronomy, uh, Nat Geo, um, uh, like various and sundry uh, Im image sites like Getty Images or uh, or um, uh, some of the other ones out there. Just looking at you know free or or uh, you know cheap uh, um, images just for generating ideas and characters and stuff. Um, I'll hit IMDb because I love to cast my NPCs and my player characters and stuff. So if I want to find an actor that I kind of have a visual idea for for a character, even if the actor is long dead and maybe was a star in the 40s or something. I'll be like, no, I want to carry Grant kind of care. I want that kind of look and feel. And uh, I, I haven't really bothered to go down into the weeds of like looking for someone who's photoshopped an actor onto a uniform or something like I, I would, it would be nice, but like sometimes they're really good photoshops and sometimes they're pretty crappy, but uh, really I'm just looking for the face and the, and like the body shape and the demeanor. And sometimes even the voice, like, I, Oh, I want a character who has a, like a Liam Neeson kind of gravelly voice and if I can't find an actor that kind of like fits out, I'll just, oh, it's just going to be, I'll, I'll just go with Liam Neeson. Um, but uh, so those pictures, um, you know, I'll pull pictures off the internet, of course. Uh, now, that, especially now that everything I'm doing, I'm doing is digital. I'm, I'm pulling everything into that Scrivener file, whether it's a picture or a video or an audio file or a schematic or uh, something for, or, or Wikipedia articles too, because you can, you can, you know, print Wikipedia articles as PDFs and then just drag that PDF right into the Scrivener file, which is great because it's just like this huge mass of information. Um, but uh, I think the, the internet is a great resource, but it's so dangerous, right? Cause it's such a rabbit hole that you can, I mean, there's so many rabbit holes you can go down. And uh, like, I, I love what Michael was saying, where if you want to, you know, research strength, like I had, when I was writing the uh, uh, keyhole of eternity for the tricorder set, um, you know, I had, to, I had to do some research on string theory. I didn't know anything about string theory. And I wasn't, I wasn't, I was not going to go buy some hundred dollar textbook on string theory to try to understand it. So I just hit Wikipedia. I was like, this is going to give me the high level stuff. And if I really want to go deeper, I can, I can hit the bibliography and, and go from there. But it gave me enough. It gave me enough to get by. And I was like, okay, this is, a, this is all I need. And now I can go take that sci-fi spin on it. So, um, yeah, there's just, I, I try to be careful about the internet though, because like, I want to play the game. I don't want to spend all night researching or all week researching or whatever. Same thing with writing. Like I'll research up to a point, but then once I, once I feel like I've got enough to, to, to make it sound good, then, then I'll, I'll, I'll quit. <laughs> yeah. When I'm creating my stories for the science and stuff, I tend to go to things like PBS space time on YouTube. It's a great channel. Yeah. Um, crash course is always a fun one to hit. If you got, if it's something that they've got on there. And then um, I'm a fan of futurists uh, like Isaac Arthur, um, also on YouTube, he's a fun one to watch his stuff mm -hmm. um, and it gets you a chance. And then I take the things I've learned from that and the things that I want to put that together and I can stick that into my show Bible. Um, and I tend to put stuff in after the players have s experienced it, right? So if you've gone through a black hole and we've done these things, um, you've seen the other side of the event horizon, you know what's going on, um, this time travel thing that's going on, all right, whatever. You know what's there. 
the players have experienced it. Here's how the players dealt with it. That all goes into the Bible so they can do that in the future again, or they can use some reference of that technology again in the future they want to. Um, I want to go ahead. I, th- I want to ask about that because you said so after each episode you write it like uh, am I the only insane one here who actually creates a mini novella after each episode so basically I and I've done this I've done this for 20 years like my old Marvel campaigns I would go back and write the comic book like what happened in it and I then I would bound those by 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 the theme and so since I started playing Star Trek Adventures I have it all in Google Docs where every single episode and I go through and I edit it too. So I want to make it sure it's legible. I don't want it to be all jibber jabbish. But am I the only one who post writes down everything that happened in novella form? No. I don't. <laughs> I mean, I, I do. Uh, um, but Jeff, go ahead and finish your thought before I jump in. Uh, I, was, I tend to write the things beforehand and then I'll go back and add the notes back in so that I fill them out. But to me, it's all just. Um, bullet points and things like that. I hit, I hit the highlight points so that I can write forward. Um, but I have a hard time once the story is written, I have a hard time going back and seeing it again because it's done. I mean, the next story is what I need to get to. Um, so it's, it tends to be hard for me to go back and write this stuff, but that's one of the, one of the reasons we record them and have them on YouTube. So. Right. The reason I did it is because it becomes my show Bible too. So I can remember what happened and I can go and, and refer it. And I'm happy to say that people who've joined our game at other times, I say, okay, because of the character you're playing, look at these key episodes. And most pe- everybody actually who plays my game has gone back and started at episode one because it reads like a novel. And, and that, and so it, 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 I just immortalizing it like that has paid off for decades of RPG for me. I always wished I could do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I, uh, I, I, because I, especially in the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years, I, I've recorded every session, like whether, whether I was running D and D or Star Trek or whatever. Um, I would, if, it, if we were face to face in person, I had a little digital recorder that would, that would record the, you know, the dialogue, you know, us talking at the table, playing, having fun. You can hear the dice clatter, all that stuff. Um, but of course it was low tech and there was no way for me to plug that, that digital recorder into my computer. So I had to transcribe. So I had to teach myself how to transcribe. And initially, like for the first few sessions, I would just do high level bullet points. We did this, we did this, this happened. Maybe I would add a little bit of color. Like if somebody did a really cool thing in combat or there was a really cool scene and something important came up, I might highlight that. Uh, If some important NPCs came up, I would remember their names and what they were all about. Um, But gradually, as the players got more into the storytelling and as I got more into the storytelling, like the, the, the recordings got to be so good that I would, I found that I was starting to transcribe it almost verbatim where I was getting the great one liners and the great, the great speeches in there. And I wanted to capture it because I wanted to honor the player who, who came up with it. But I also wanted to use it because I was, I, was, I knew I was going to add it to my, my show Bible because I can mine that stuff for, for plot hooks and story ideas later to help tie in to the whole overarching narrative so that, that, you know, the players are like, wait, this character, we, this character was like a throwaway character, like five episodes ago. And now there's like this whole backstory to them. And like, it's, it's, it all ties together. Uh, so my, my synopses have gotten much more involved. I don't think I've gone quite to the level of actually writing it out like a novel. Cause it, it just takes a more creative brain space than I want to give to it because I feel like the, the players and I are really building it together. And I don't want to add that extra level of my own creativity being imposed upon on, on top of it. So I, I try to keep it kind of like kind of mid-level where I'm hitting everything that we did, but I'm also, I'm also adding all the great detail that they add, especially their dialogue and stuff. Because they, once they get, once they really get into the characters, it, they're the characters. It's not them role-playing. It's like I'm, I'm hearing their characters talking. And like, yeah. oh, I wanna, so, so I'm almost, I've almost become like a, a script writer, right? Where I'm, 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 I'm you know, writing the dialogue. But they've already provided the dialogues. So I'm really just transcribing it. Yeah, I want to be um, clear that that's what I do yeah. too. I actually, because we play on Discord, I actually yeah. cut and paste their exact dialogue. Okay, I admit I edit it for punctuation and stuff. But 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 I actually take their what they wrote in Discord, paste it, and then all I do is reframe it so that it all has kind of the same voice. They all have their own voice because it's their dialogue, but the narrative part kind of has a, my voice, you know. Yeah. So my video game yours is a text text-based game yeah we're doing text-based yeah when it's in when it's 
I haven't played um, a continuing series Star Trek tabletop. So I haven't had to do that. We play tabletop games and I'll do bullet points because these aren't as committed players, my tabletop ones. But back in the day when I did do tabletop Marvel, yes, I actually would spend a week transcribing it. Like I took notes during the game and then I would go back and write it out and they loved it. I'd hand them the comic at the end, you know, of the season. Yeah, mm-hmm. Michael, you actually raise a good point about the about the the player commitment, right? Sometimes I have really committed players who who will go to the effort of writing notes and 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 keeping up on the transcriptions or keeping up on the uh, you know refreshing their memory before they go to the next session. And then I've had players who are like, nah, I just want to show up and play. I don't really remember what happened. Do you have a synopsis or do you have some bullet points I can look at to refresh my memory? And more often than not, it fell on me to do the work of transcribing the recording or, or getting those bullet points together. And, uh, you know, when you're talking about a three hour session where we're going full throttle, except for maybe like a 15 minute break, that's, that's a lot of stuff. Like people can, can fill a lot of words into a minute, right? I mean, you, you can talk a lot in a minute. <laughs> I know we do. Um, but, but like to take three hours of that and to find the time in your day, you know, in, in conjunction with, you know, family work, life, freelance jobs, whatever, like, where do you find the, the time is like to transcribe a three hour session probably takes me 10, 10 to 12 hours to get it right. And, uh, I just don't have the kind of time anymore. <laughs> like I wish I did, but, uh, it is, and then that, that I actually saw that that had an impact on the game because the players who weren't as committed were like, Oh, I don't really remember what happened last session. So I'm just going to kind of wing it and then get into it. And maybe I'll figure it out by the middle of the session. And the other players can kind of pull me along. Yeah. That right. forces you to be episodic. Master. Yeah. Right. Right. Whereas yeah. me as a game master, I had just spent 12 hours transcribing the damn thing. So it was all fresh in my head. And I was like, oh, come on. Now I've got to pull you along and help you out and re- remind you about, about this. And it's like, oh, it's exhausting. <laughs> I, I have to just give a non sequitur. I'm sorry. I, I just going to say, because my players to this day, 20 to 30 years going back, I will tell them, remember when this happened? And I'll tell them the whole scenario. And they think I'm insane. They're like, how do you remember this? And it's to your point, Jim, because I transcribed it all. That's why. Right. 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 It, it gets into the memory differently. Yeah. Yep. So we do, uh, in, in my games, I tend to use while we're gaming, um, we use roll 20, uh, and discord for voice. Um, but while we're gaming, I keep uh, Microsoft one note open, or you could use any program, but I keep one note open and I have all my show notes in that. And I've got each episode as its own tab, all that stuff, each season, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I'll keep notes in there and I'll keep the, as the game is going, like the player said this, I'll put a, a, a note there. Um, and then I'll start typing like the other notes that I want to tie this into this over here so that I can go back and see them. And that's the stuff that winds up in the show Bible. Um, on top of that, uh, anytime we meet a new species in the game, I write the species out. If I created it, I'm like one of the species I created is a group called the Laramarians. They're uh, rock based lava silicate based creatures. I mean, I wrote their whole societal structure, how to make them as player characters. If you want to, what their home world looks like, what their structures and all that stuff. I did it all. Once they've met the, once the players have met this world and they've had their interactions, that goes in the Bible as well. So they can go back and reference this. Um, and then what episodes we, we watched it, like we, we encountered them in, um, is usually there as a note. If I remember to get them in there. Um, I think that's another thing that that's a good thing to have in there. Um, when we're going through and adding, uh, all of the notes that we're putting in there, um, I think it's nice to have all of that. The transcriptions would be very nice, but how much of that is you're going back and reading? Um, when you guys are talking about building out story for the future though, um, and using your Bibles for that, how do you guys use that to propel future story? Like one of the things that we do, uh, is we have a, a sheet that has all the character stats on them and all that stuff. Uh, it's a big spreadsheet. And then each character will go through and put in like, these are beats I want to hit in an upcoming story. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'll put those, I'll mix that with stuff that I've got from the Bible and other things I'm, that I'm doing for my own stories. And we'll hit those. Um, is that, how do you guys prepare stories that players want because their their stories are ever evolving they they have new story beats they want to hit how do you guys track that and ensure that you're going to make those story beats even if you're not going to do them the next session but like three sessions down the road is that mm-hmm. something you guys do or or mm-hmm. how, if so how do you do it yeah absolutely um it, and this is uh <laughs> this is another another peek into my brain this is this is like like the the um uh, what do you what do you call it the um uh, when, when something proceeds, it's like the, it's like the proto mission brief almost like I, I, I've even got examples in my Bible, in my, in my binder here. Um, especially once, a 
Actually, no, it actually, it actually starts at like session zero. And once I start hearing about the players and their characters and I start seeing their backstories, like I will, I will be able to pull out. And, and fortunately I've been, I have been blessed with the majority of my players have been really good about creating histories and backstories for their characters, not necessarily in a big narrative format, but at least in bullet points. And they're, they're usually really good about giving me plot hooks about things that they want that are in their backstory that maybe they want to explore at some point. And uh, once I start, once I have that slate, right, those five or six player characters and all that information, I can start pulling out pieces and bits and pieces of, of plot hooks and ideas. And, oh, that could tie into this and this could tie into this. And, oh, these are really similar. So maybe those are going to be tied in together. And what I'll actually do is I'll start, I'll start thinking about episode concepts that I can tie into the, all that, all that stuff. And I'll actually write, I mean, I wrote like the, the, the er version like the like the the point zero one version of a mission brief where i'd have like a high level here's an episode i think i want to run here's this cool concept that i want to explore as a game master that i want to expose my players to and see what happens with it and i want this to be uh i want this episode to be focused on this character or this character so like kind of like a spotlight role uh that we that we do in star trek adventures because like that's what we see on the show right oh this is a Riker episode this is a picard episode here's an ensemble piece Here's the Troy episode. Here's the Crusher episode. Like, I really tried to do that to make sure everybody had an opportunity to be in the spotlight. And that was all built off of their histories and their backstories. Um, and also just my concepts of like, oh, what kind of stories do I want to tell as a game master and a storyteller? Um, and I would just start. I would, so I would have like like actual five or six different sheets of paper and say, OK, here's episode one. Here's episode two. Here's episode three. Here's episode eight. Somewhere somewhere in this season, I want to tell this story. Don't know when it's going to fall into place and depending on what the players do, but I want to explore this and I want to explore this and I want this character's, you know, major NPC that they put in their backstory to be a really key part of that. So that'd be like a major beat in that episode. And, uh, and I'll start fleshing those out, but I will actually have those in physical paper format. Of course, now it's all Scrivener. Like I'm opening up a separate, um, you know, chapter file for each, uh, each episode I want to run. And so what, by doing that, because I think in seasons, right, I think in, I think in seasons and episodes, which has its own de detriments, but that's a different conversation. Um, and so, like, I can start once I start mapping out the episodes I want to run and how the players backstories, the player characters backstories are tying into each of those episodes. Then I can actually start seeing the structure of what the whole season looks like. Right. And again, a lot of that is, is built right off of the 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 show Bible and the, the making of DS9 books. Because they were they were not just thinking about the pilot, they were thinking about the whole season, right? Because that's what the writers' room has to do. They have to think about not only all the episodes that they're going to just throw out there to churn, but like they started thinking about the arc. What's the story arc from first episode to the end of the season? What's the our story arc from the first episode to the end of the series, right? Like because they had to tie in emissary to what we left behind, right? So there's there's a narrative thread throughout the entire seven year season. And yeah. and that's the stuff I'm thinking about when I'm pulling all these episodes together. Um is I want I want there to be a cohesive whole to not just each individual episode and each of the characters' arcs, but also the whole story, the whole season as well. So that it looks like it feels like a cohesive whole. And we're just not just throwing it together week after week and seeing what happens, right? I, I try to be more structured than that. And uh, it, I mean, yeah, that, that's where, where I am really. It's, it's very, very intensive, but it's all built on the characters. Everything's built yeah. on the characters because uh, they're, 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 the players are there to play their characters and they want to be heroes, like we talked about in the last episode. Um, and I want to enable that as much as possible. And uh, if a player is going to go through the effort to create a backstory, I feel like it's my responsibility to pay some up to pay tribute to that and say, look, you, you put the effort, like a lot of players won't put the effort in, right. And that's okay. But the players that do put the effort in, like, I'm really going to pay attention to that because like, you're, you're, you're telling me what you want. You may not be saying it, you know, right in my face, but subconsciously you're putting this into your backstory. You want those threads to be pulled and, mm -hmm. and I'm going to pull them. So I'll find a way to do it. Yeah. That's a great example of how to, a good way to use a Bible too, is the, that, if you have the season arc, you have your episode arc, you have your uh, series arc. And I think that's a, a good thing to help main the, 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 these Bibles show Bibles can help maintain. Michael, what was your thoughts on that? What's interesting is 
until uh, I'll go back to my previous history, my, my other big campaign before Star Trek, it was always character focused. It was always, what's your life? Who's your family? What's your day job? And then every episode I would write had to do with, this is interrupting your life. And so I think that carried over into Star Trek adventures where we have some pretty epic characters where they know what their career in Starfleet is. They know what their plan to get to retirement is even. And so they kind of have these arcs and they know that they, what their jobs are. And for the first time in all of my RPG history, I actually use the Star Trek Adventures modules, which is strange for me. Before, I was never satisfied with modules from other gaming companies. I was like, now nah, my story is better. But what I found, what's cool because they're episodically written primarily, the Star Trek Adventures modules or mission briefs, is that my characters are already pushing in a life course. We already know what those are from session zero. And so these are interruptions to their life. And so and many times during our games, what will happen is they're in the middle of their life. The story happens and the players are like, man, I want to get back to that juicy conversation we were having. But dang it, we got to take care of this problem first. Um, and so that is thrilling to me in that these modules don't interrupt because the story is the characters. It's their life that we're interested in, their their relationships and their children and their weird aunts that come to visit and family issues back home. And now I actually am glad to be on this ship because I don't want to be around my family. And so w those are the kind of stuff we deal with. What, what they're, in, our, in our show Bible, we have their day-to-day -day itinerary. We have the drinks and, and foods that are only on their ship that they love introducing people to that they've discovered their own discoveries, their trophy rooms. And these are things that I don't need to do anything. And I can say, okay, you guys, this is your job. What are y'all doing? And they're in playing all these scenes, showing people their trophies, playing their favorite sports, their favorite holodeck programs. And then boom, I get that story started. Um, and, and so having the show Bible of what are these characters all about makes it super easy um, to keep that drama going. Yeah. That's a great use of it. I, I like the idea. I don't think I've gone quite that in depth in some of the areas, but I think that's something we should do. Um, the nice thing about having this, and again, we've talked about the GMs don't need to do this, but if you really want to get that depth, it's a good way to uh, to add realism to your world. You're adding a grounding to your world. Everything you write, every page you do in these Bibles, if you do them, uh, is another thing that unites the party uh, in a common narrative. Um, and that's the thing. I think that's the real purpose of what the show Bible is there to do is make sure that narratively speaking and thematically speaking, we're all on the same page and we're going to be able to be on the same page going forward. Um, I think it's an excellent, uh, it's done one other thing. It's done one other thing too. The show Bible is this season in my game, season five, it's the first time that people raise their hand and says, you know what? I want to GM a game. I want to tell a story. And now they have all this reference material to use and they don't need me because they're like, wait, I remember this. Let me, let me control F search the Google doc for the name of this character. I can find all the places it was mentioned. And then therefore I can get the backstory myself and I can help them if they forget. But since I have everything in Discord channels, like all our favorite drinks, locations, enemies, uh, this space station we're hanging out at a lot, and they're helping build the sections of it. Um, I love having the show Bible because now they can take it on their own and do their own episode, just like we saw in real Star Trek. Um, writers would change off because they had a show Bible. They knew don't deviate too far here. Don't step on this person's toe here. That's their story arc, but play within these guidelines. And um, so far this season, we've had some really, really good games with um, alternating GMs. Awesome. Yeah. And that's uh that's gosh, Michael, that's another episode right there is, uh, is running a game with alternating GMs. Um, you know, you don't have to be the only game master in the group. You could have multiple game masters. That, that, that would be a great topic for conversation. If we haven't done, have we done that? We, we may have done it. I don't remember. Uh, we'll have to go back and look at the archives. Um, but, uh, um, I, I lost my train of thought. Oh, oh, so one of the benefits I think of, of, of a show Bible it was what I was talking to earlier and just, you know, riffing on what you guys are saying is that, if you are kind of diligent about building it, then you have this great home of history and memory that you've built together with your group. And if you're able to create it in a format that you can share with them, whether it's, um, excuse me, my cat's with me. Uh, we, you know, say hi, Viola has never been on the show before. Hey, Viola. Hello. <laughs> She's usually sleeping on the couch over there. But, uh, um, 
uh, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. So the uh, the show Bible can be a tangible thing and a tangible memory. And uh, if you're able to print it off and give it to your players, or if you're able to even get it bound, like you could you could do it on Amazon or Lulu or any number of things. So if you can just create the format, just you know, print off one, you know, print, print off five copies or whatever, and you you got that tangible thing that you can mm-hmm. remember that you built together, which is awesome. Um, so so that's a, that's a benefit of a show Bible. Um, I, I would say though, I, I have to be fair and show the other side of the coin. One of the challenges that you might run into when building a show Bible is if you put a lot of effort into it, especially like me, where I'm talking about, you know, planning five, six, seven episodes down the road and like the cohesiveness of the entire series. Like if something happens and, and that, sh- and that, and that series goes off the rails and your players disappear and that, and that game collapses, which, you know, certainly happens. Then, then there's that, that moment of loss of like, Oh, I, I had so many great ideas for that campaign and it's dead now. <laughs> and then, yeah. And then you can recycle it to some of us because right. you history and you, and you get, you get the Bible, right? So you can recycle some of those story ideas and stuff, which is perfectly fine. But I, I, I've had a handful of campaigns over the, <laughs> over the ages, you know, collapse and die. And it's like, Oh, darn it. It would have been really cool to finally get to some of that stuff with the players and the characters and the yeah. stuff. But, but you know how it is. That's, Even- that's the downside. <laughs> Even with the constant game that you have playing, we never get to all of our I, all our I, all of our ideas. I I never have. I mean, I'm going to give it tell a story that was told by um, Eric Campbell too and Thomas Maroney, um, just so people kind of think about it. Is they started the USS Ross started from an RPG and they had kept their notes and, and um, Jackson Lansing had actually kept, I think a lot of notes on Tholians as did Jody Hauser too. And this was all from their RPG. And because they kept all those notes, eventually it ended up being a part of a comic book IDW. And I have to say that with all the notes I've kept over the years and these crazy ideas and fantastic sciences that they've been an excellent repository of me for sparking ideas for writing for Star Trek adventures. I'm like, I'm not going to do exactly the same thing, but Oh, no one's ever seen this before except my five players. Um, and I'll ask them sometimes. I was like, Hey, you know, I'll, I'll say, Hey, I want to use this idea. You think I can do that? And they're like, yeah, oh, heck yeah. We want to see that, you know? And, um, even I'll say with my release today, um, the one that came out, uh, for, for, for uh, eight, eight layers deep, um, some of those concepts of this crazy scientist came from my game 20 years ago. And the name of the character, even, I, I asked my friends, do you mind if I use it? Yeah, go ahead. You know, and, and they were thrilled to see a concept even come alive that was at our private table. Um, so the, this, the, the, every good writer keeps notes. And for us who are playing RPG, we, are in, we all aspire to be writers and we're unintentionally maybe even feeding future concepts that like... <laughs> Eric Campbell's group ended up actually showing up on, on a TV show, Picard, you know, season three. So that's the dream of the show Bible, right? Mm -hmm. So in conclusion about show Bibles, I would say, um, I don't want to scare people and think that you need to do this in order to be a game master. Honestly, if you're going to be playing one-off games, um, with your friends and no one really cares that much. Okay. You don't have to, you can just play a game by game and go off memory and deal with it being episodic. But if you really, you know, think you have the nerves to take notes and especially with all the electronic mediums we have now to record while we play, whether it's discord or whether it's Google, uh, drive or, or something like that try it, see what happens. Take some high level notes. If you're an aspiring writer, like I always wanted to be, it's a great way to write every single night because you know what happened. So now you get to transcribe it and get your writing chops. I have over 30 years of writing based on the RPGs we played. And now it's finally paying off not to get you scared, but it's actually paying off now. So, so great exercise and, um, you know, just something, something worth doing in my opinion, Jim, what about you? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, if you're a game master and you're doing more than just one shots or one offs or whatever, and you're actually starting to build a, you know, kind of a cohesive story, even if it's like three or five sessions or something, you're inevitably probably going to be building a Bible of some sort, even if you don't realize it, even if it's just session notes or it's a Google doc or something that you're keeping updated for your players. That's, that's uh, the the beginnings of a Bible right there. Right. And, um, you know, as, I'll echo Michael, you know, as a, as a writer, um, like, like formative, that was how I started to learn how to write and how to structure story and not just structure story, but I think in series, right? So I, 
I can't write a one a standalone novel. I, I think in series because I watch TV so much. TV is especially Star Trek. Right, Star Trek is in my brain to such a level that anytime I think of a, a great concept for a for a novel, I'm always thinking series. And when I'm thinking series, I've got to have a Bible. I've got to fill it with NPCs, characters, locations, situations, stuff, and that that translates super super easily to a role playing game. Uh, and in fact, it's a little easier with a role playing game because I've got players who are creating their characters. And that takes some of the creative load off of me because I don't have to create everything. I can, I can, I can have them help me, or we can all collectively do it together. So it's, uh, it's super fun, great exercise. There's all kinds of tools out there for for creating, um, you know, world building bibles. Lean into the writers, uh, Scrivener. I, I, I love Scrivener, but it's not the only tool. There are plenty of other tools out there. Even just a humble Word document or Google document, uh, it works. It's online. It's in the cloud. Why not use it? Right? It's free, so uh, that doesn't suck. Um, so yeah, have fun with it. And, uh, if nothing else, you know, especially if you're getting into a long-term campaign, you know, in the back of your mind, if it feels like it's a lot of work, just remember that you're going to have something so cool to look back on and say, look at this thing that we created. Like you may never publish it. You may never do anything with it other than just look at it on the shelf, but there's such a huge rewarding feeling to see that thing that you, you and your group created and you can go back and look at it and go like, oh yeah, this was really awesome. Uh, so, so have fun with it. All right. Well, my thoughts on this really reflect a lot of what Jim and Michael have already said. I am a big fan of these show Bibles. Obviously, this is something that really speaks to me. I'm a, a consummate writer. I like to do these more in-depth things. And I think they're a really good way for players and game masters to be able to maintain that uh, in-world continuity, that continuity of their own storytelling um, which I think is a supremely important thing to do. I, I think uh, you can do anything that's wild and extraordinary as long as you're consistent within your own setting and, and narrative. Um, these are advanced game mastering tips. This is not something that just everybody needs to do. Uh, and in fact, really, I think everyone really, as I think as Jim said, uh, does this whether you think you do or not. To some extent, you're maintaining a headcanon as to what your story is and what your narrative is. And the only real thing about this is you're writing it down. It's the only real difference. And writing it down will help you in the long run maintain a better remembrance of your storytelling uh, and the things you've done. I think it's a really good, uh, a really good way to get to that next level of storytelling. One of the things we always talk about, especially in comedy, is uh, you always bring it back to the joke, right? You always bring it back around to your joke or to your whatever your your earlier things were. Um, and that's something you can really do much easier when you've got uh, a Bible like this to be able to refer to. Uh, Jim said uh, using Scrivener. I also use Scrivener. It's a great program. It is not a free program. Um, but there are free programs out there. Microsoft OneNote is a really good program. I primarily use that for my current campaigns. Um, uh, and then there's a bunch of uh, like wiki type things that are out there for Dungeons and Dragons players and things like that. They're very popular. Uh, and you can just search for them there. I, I don't have enough on my head. I, I meant to grab a couple and have a links for them, but I forgot. Uh, but that's something that you can absolutely take a look at and they're out there for you. Uh, and that's something that you can have player facing. Your players can just go and check it out. It can be global facing and the whole world can go see the storytelling that you're doing and the world building that you're doing. Uh, and this is really about world building as much as it is storytelling. You're, you're going to create this, this deep, resonating world, um, that you can call back to repeatedly. And I think that's something that's, uh, uh, essential for really, really next level storytelling. So again, advanced game mastering technique and, and topic. Um, but I think that with a little bit of work, anyone can do this. All right. So as usual, I want to do my brick and mortar gratitude. So appreciative of all those stores where you can go in and, and get and pick up any kind of RPG book you want. Of course, we love Star Trek Adventures and love hearing that you picked up those books. Um, today, I am going to be shouting out a shout out from Nathan Dowdell, the very creator of the mechanic systems uh, for Star Trek Adventures. And he talks about the Dice Cup in Nottingham in the UK. So thank you, Nathan, for doing a shout out for continuing conversation conversations. We appreciate that, Jim. Super awesome. Uh, a couple of gratitudes. I want to thank, um, I want to thank all the writer rooms, all the Star Trek writer rooms over the years, original series, next gen DS9, Voyager enterprise, all of them. Um, the fact that you were, you created those writer Bibles, uh, and, and they found their way into the fandom. Of course they do. Uh, you know, Judy and Garfield Reed Stevens for the DS9 book, all that stuff. 
really, really formative for me personally. And I can't thank you enough for all the work that you put into the, all the episodes and just building the series and giving us awesome templates with which to, to, to be inspired by and then to build upon. So thank you for that. Um, also got to thank the crew of the USS Athena. This is, this is one of the great campaigns I ran way back in the day. So, uh, uh, Matt, John, Robbie, Tim, uh, Todd, uh, and everybody, uh, Freddie, everybody else I can't remember. I mean, it's been so long now, but, uh, uh, RJ, um, thank you for, for being in that campaign and thank you for helping me build those foundations of being a good GM, uh, to where, to where I've been able to expand that to be where I am now. So thanks. Thanks to the Athena. I always love the Athena. 30 plus years strong. So uh, kudos to the Athena. And uh, you know what, Michael, I realized I forgot this last episode. So a double thank you to the fans of this game. Uh, I forgot last session, last episode. So I'm going to remember this episode and I'll do a doubly. Uh, thank you so much to all the fans of Star Trek Adventures uh, over the years who are playing this game, uh, getting involved in the game, introducing the game to new people, and also being so supportive of all the new players coming in. Like fortunately, you know, Star Trek is evergreen. There's constantly new episodes coming out all the time. We're right in the throes of uh, Picard season three uh, coming out now. And uh, there's more to come. Lots of, uh, not Picard, but like lots more Star Trek to come. And uh, the fact that new players are discovering this game every day and that the fan base is so healthy that the, like the Facebook and the discord and the Reddit and all of, all the different social media channels, the players independently of anybody from Adiphius are, are taking it upon themselves to help other players learn the game, answer questions, Great, great content on continuing conversation. Uh, the the number one fan site in the uh, in the game. So thank you for that, Michael. Uh, but th thanks to the fans. Like I, again, I, I don't say it often enough, but without the fans, we would not be doing this game. And uh, so I can't thank you enough for that. So thank you for being so supportive and such an awesome group of uh, of people. I love talking to you all every day on social media, and I love watching the Twitches and the YouTubes and stuff because it, it just inspires me to see what you're doing with the game. Uh, Jeff, why don't you close this out? Give us your gratitude. I think I want to, my gratitude today is actually all the writers for the Star Trek Adventures RPG. Uh, and the books that you buy are part of a show Bible. Essentially they are the thing that establishes the world and the setting and all of these things the characters can do, uh, and all the places they can go, the locations, the ships, the enemies, that's all part of a show Bible. And I think that that's a great place to start. If even if you don't necessarily want to sit down and write your own, um, the books that you can get from Odiphius are already the beginnings of a show Bible. It's one of the nice things about role playing games is you've a lot of the work is already done for you, um, and these books are really well written. I especially like the uh, Game Master's Guide and Players Guide. I think they are the two uh, essential must have books uh, aside from the core role play, uh, the core RPG book. Um, I think they really help expand not only the universe, but the idea of the way characters and storytellers interact and do things. So those are books that I think are really great. Um, I also want to give a quick thanks to uh, a shout out to uh, fun for all gaming in Ann Arbor, Ypsilanti, Michigan. Uh, they are a long-term gaming store. I've been going to them for years and years, uh, over 25 years. They're not my first gaming store, but they're, uh, they were one of the most influential ones for me. And I think, uh, I really, they, they're, well deserved to have a big shout out and uh, Rich and the owner there. Rich is the owner there and uh, Derek, the uh, one of the clerks, has been there for over 20 years. So it's a great store. Uh, I encourage everyone to go see them. Uh, yeah, I don't have anything else for that. Oh, an amazing continuing conversations. I can't wait to go back and review my show Bible and maybe even peek at some of yours if you want to share them on continuing conversations. Until next time, or continuing missions, our blog. Until next time, IDIC. So long and thanks for all the fish. Live long and prosper. Be safe, be well. We'll talk to you all next time. Bye.